running and pass catching and things like that. You have to encompass everything, um, you know, to be a, a, an all around receiver. And in a, in a position, right, where you're lining up against a dude, you know, who's, who's just as confident, if not more confident than you, you know, how do you gain that mental edge? Like, what do you look, you know, what are you doing to ensure that, you know, you stay sharp in your mind? I know one of the things I, I, I picked up from Drew a while back and I, and I love, and that's something that I tell my guys all the time is, you know, he, he talks all the time about positive self-talk. Like you gotta, you gotta talk yourself up. I mean, if you, if for one minute, man, you slip, that DB owns you. And uh, that's a big aspect of, of, playing receiver obviously in, in every in every position right I, and I'm I firmly stand behind this guys like I'm someone especially at the high school level I just feel like uh, the mental the mental game the mental aspect of it is huge um, obviously kids at this at this age range and this level aren't as mentally tough right as you get older so this is the time where you start to build that now you can really uh, take advantage of, of certain aspects of the game I've seen it you guys seen it um, I think it's huge so uh, I love what he talks about with, with the positive self-talk. And I'll kind of, uh, Drew, I'll kind of let you just jump into that, you know, your, your kind of whole yeah. thought process on the positive self-talk uh, self -talk aspect and whatnot. And I think that was, a, it's a great transition. So like to me, right, like receiver especially, I think you can argue receiver is the most mentally challenging position in football. It's, it's the only position where you're asked to do your job over and over and over with no reward, right? So it's the only time you're asking a 16-year-old kid in high school to really just live by blind faith that to continue running his routes as if he's going to get the ball to continue block. Like you have to, at the receiver position, you have to play every single play as if this is a play that could be the game winning play, but you have no idea when it's coming. It's not like at left tackle, you know, I got to make this block. I did my job right at corner. If they don't throw you the ball at corner. You did your job. You could get open all day and be the best route runner on the field and, ha and ha be in the third quarter and have zero catches. And it's not your fault. And yet, how do you continue to stay positive through that? And I think like that's that's one thing, you know, I think everyone talks about positive self-talk or all this stuff that can apply through all positions. I think you really, if you're a receivers coach, you really have to understand the nature, like everyone wants to call receivers divas. Like, well, let me ask you this. If you were doing something in your life and you did it well over and over and over and never got credit for it, never got praised for it, never had the ball thrown your way, when it finally fucking was thrown your way, wouldn't you want to show off a little bit? Like just naturally, like, like, yeah. You know what I mean? So I think like with a lot of these kids, I think, we have to kind of realize what's going through their head as a 16 year old kid who cares about clout and cares about flashy shit and cares about kids thinking he's cool. Like that's the reality. It's not, you're not cool as a receiver unless the ball's in your hand. So how do you build, how do you build a culture that allows your players to stay motivated, to continue playing hard and to be selfless when, and without attaching their value that they're having to their team to receiving the football. Right. And I think that starts in the, in the run game. Right. No, the, the, just to kind of piggyback real quick, that kind of like diva aspect or, or that, you know, you know, throw me the ball type of deal. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's there's a limit to I think you have to I think you have to keep it under wraps. But I don't you know, to say you, you have to eliminate it, I think is kind of going against um, the position itself. Like, don't you want to do that's confident enough to be right. like, yo, you throw me the ball. I'm, I'm going to make it happen. Exactly. Like, I would want a guy like that out there when you're going up against, once again, it's a, it's a dude across from you that's just as athletic, if not more athletic, just as confident and not more confident. Like, I want a guy that's like, yeah, like, throw me the ball. I'm going to make it now. Managing it, I think, is is the task that a lot of coaches maybe fall short, and that's where these uh, these problems come mm -hmm. about. You know, um, you know, managing that room is is crucial. And, and that's what I think from from right up, from the beginning, I think you you need to create an environment, A, like, I just, I just think that if you do not create an environment in the receiver room that's built around toughness and built around mm -hmm. the run game, it's going to cause problems down the road because it's impossible to keep five receivers satisfied through a season, through a game, through a drive. And so if their value is based on their stats, it's going to cause problems. But if the value in your room is the way you finish, the way you – you know, the, how hard you play with your attitude, all those things. And, 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 but the key to that, right, the, the problem with that is it's exhausting to coach that way. If you're going to coach that way, you have to hype up a backside cutoff block the yep. same way you would hype up an 80-yard touchdown. Yep. And I think, I think a lot of guys either don't have the energy for that, they don't have the attention to detail to hype up those things, and then it becomes this room of, like, you know, you're just trying to keep the receivers at bay and have them not cause problems. Whereas instead, if you really hype this run game stuff and you really, like, from the first day, there is a commitment to, to excelling in the run game, and that is the most important thing to you, 
it eliminates excuses from everybody else on your team. Like when your receivers are the toughest guys in the field and your receivers are, are willing to play through the echo of the whistle, what excuses does a left tackle have? Does a running back have? Like, like when your divas are the tough guys, no, nobody else can has an excuse not to show up and fight. And, and I, you know, I, I've had it with all my guys. Like you can really watch it change a culture. Like when I, when I, like I've seen it on multiple occasions at Rutgers, we turn the culture around through the run game through the run game of, you know, our, our receivers setting the tone. And I think it's, it's a really powerful thing that, that, you know, and we can get into the slide too, but it's a real powerful thing that I think everyone. I'll also say this with the, with the culture building aspect, I think another, another, uh, as uh, another part of it where coaches, I think, or, or just in general, right. You fall short is it's gotta be consistent. Like for instance, if I'm getting on a dude, you know, 99 times in a row. And on that hundredth time, I'm like, uh, I'll pretend I didn't see it. That doesn't work. And I, I just right. feel like it almost, I don't, I don't want to say it totally discredits everything, but it takes a big uh, step back. Like it's constant. And that's exhausting too, right? Because you're like, you have to, and now, don't get me wrong. I mean, you may miss something here and there, but I'm talking about you knowingly saw it, right? Didn't say anything. Cause you're like, ah, we just, no, it's got to be that all. And now what I would say is like, you, you have to coach finish every day. I think there's another mistake yeah. you just make is like, you have to coach finish. Like you have to teach them to finish. You have to teach, you have to put these kids in situations where they want to give up and they have to dig down deeper and find a way to get more out of themselves. Even a simple thing like, like I'll do at the end of grueling fucking practices, right? Practices, what's the, after grueling practice, grueling conditioning at Bosco, I've never seen people, I've never seen kids get conditioned harder than at Don Bosco. And yet at the end of all that shit, I will still have them do a, a push-up hold to where they're, they're just staying in a push-up plank as long as they can until someone breaks, right? But it's building that mentality of like, when you think you're exhausted, when you think you're finished, when you think the job is over, how do you find a way to dig down and just hold a fucking push-up position for the next four minutes? Oh, yeah. And just that simple act. And then you go, you know, you talk to them and you feel like, it's so interesting. Like if you went back to Wesley anywhere I go and they hear the word, they, they can still hear me to this day yelling, finish, finish. Like that's all I used to yell. Right. And it, and it yeah. becomes a joke where guys kind of make fun of it. But you know what? I get texts every day from guys who are a year removed from college, two years removed from college, working in the real world saying, Hey, coach leaves. I was having a tough day today. But I just thought of your stupid voice yelling, finish in my ear. Like, <laughs> and, like, that shit really does carry over. Um, I had, no, for sure. I had a receiver uh, send me, you know, been sending me videos of him training right now. And, uh, you know, he sent me a couple. And, and, I mean, nice route, caught the ball, but – and then just caught the ball and stopped. And I'm like, right. what are you doing, man? I don't – it routes on air, doesn't matter. You know, you got to constantly work that finish. That creates terrible habits uh, if you're not yeah. doing it. Once again, it's that mentality. Like it's that mentality of constantly finishing your job. So like, I think it even goes to like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm in the run game. I'm blocking. Maybe dude kind of got the best of me on that point, but I'm, I'm, I'm still looking to finish that job. I'm going back at him and it's constant. It's constant. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I think it's a good place to like jump into this. So this is like kind of the first slide of this run game presentation I have. And, and this is what I really believe about finish. And I posted this about the, on that post about CD lamb yesterday, making those two blocks. I don't know if you guys yeah. saw that, but nothing displays a player's character or commitment to his team more than his willingness to finish the, his opponent in the run game. And, and I think the biggest thing of this is finish is a conscious decision, not a skill. And I just think that as a coach, you have to value finish above all else. And, and the way players finish, the way players handle themselves, like I, like in the NFL, it's different, right? Like I, I've in the NFL, they don't get paid to block. They, they, their job is to score touchdowns. They can be a little softer, but they've, they, they've afforded that luxury because they, their, their skill is taking them to the highest of high levels. If you're anything short of that, the run game has to be valued more and more. And what I'll tell you is more and more receivers are valuing the run game more and more in the NFL because it's getting harder and harder to get on the field. There right. So like now, nowadays, like it's not good enough just to be some fast guy that can run. Everyone can run routes nowadays. Look at these receivers in this draft. Now there's truly is a need for that physical, dirty, tough guy receiver that can do these jobs that other guys are not willing to do, do these jobs that I guarantee you, of the first 15 receivers taken, they haven't been asked to be to do some dirty work in the run game in a long time. So if you're at the highest level, you can you can really separate yourself from those guys and, and at all levels. Here's a here's a question for you that came in. Uh, did you have to battle the the better player uh, who didn't want to push himself for the push up holds for for an example? So gave like less than maximal effort. I I would rather die than allow myself to coach a kid who doesn't want to. I, I would I will would rather get fired in that minute then allow a kid not like if he's not willing, I will literally come to blows with a kid and, and know I'm going to get fired before I allow him to be soft in front of my face. I just, it's not in my nature. I can't do it. So like, to me, like to me, I, I would always rather go out doing things my way 
than ever, ever, ever succumb to another kid's, like, I don't give a, I, there's no choice. There's just no choice. Either you're going to quit or I'm going to get fired, one or the other. You're not allowed to be on my field. Like, I, I just I just think that you're not allowed to be on my field and be soft. That's it. If you want to play for me, you're going to do it this way. And if you don't like that and you want to go complain to your parents and, that, and, and they complain to the principal, and as a result, I lose my job, this wasn't the place for me to coach anyway. But I'm, I'm sure as hell not going to step on this field and have you represent me. Like, as soon as you're my player, you're a representation of me. I'm not allowing you to carry my name out and, and, and represent me in a way that I'm not proud of. So, like, I just don't give him a choice. There's no there's, – right. there's literally no choice. If the best and getting player, the, and, we're better getting the best – getting the best players on board gets everybody else in line. Yeah. Let's be real. You know but, like, I mean? that's it. Like, if you don't – if you don't treat them the same, you're lost. Like, we had a kid at Bosco. It's five-star fucking running back, Jalen Berger. And the first year we were there, we had a different head coach my first year, and we treated him bigger than the team, and we fucking sucked. And the next year – we, the kid almost quit. We pushed him past his limit. We had, we had a new staff. We stopped treating him special. We, try, we stopped giving him all this bullshit. And the minute he finally bought in, everything turned around. We won eight straight games and went to a state championship. And it was truly because your best player bought in and we stopped treating him as if he was bigger than everybody else. We, we used to have this fear that, oh, my goodness, if we lose Jalen Berger, like, you know, the, the, the fans, the fans are going to – the parents are going to be in an uproar and the, head, and the head coach was always worried about getting fired if that kid wasn't pleased and all this shit. But we were never going to win – big games when when we made it apparent that this kid's talent took precedence over the, the the best thing for the team because we allowed him to not give his full effort in special teams or in special teams and conditioning and all this shit and the minute we nixed that we became a championship team right. uh, and I don't think there, there's a reason what you look at I have a theory there's not a lot of diva showboaty receivers that have won Super Bowls look at it Na name one besides Michael Irvin T.O. one before he was really that type of personality those guys who love to make it about themselves the Odell Beckhams of the world, like say what you want. I know he plays hard. I know people say he's a great teammate. When he speaks, it is never a we narrative. It is always an I narrative. It's always about me and my performance and the attention on me. And when that is the narrative from one of your best players, I don't think you can build a winning culture around that. Like there's a reason why there have not been a lot of those alpha receivers that have won Super Bowls. And I think you need the right alpha quarterback that can control him. Mm -hmm. But like, it, I think it, it's hard no matter what he does, what, say what you want. Hey, Odell's a great teammate. Hey, he works hard. This, when you're in front of the media and it's never about the team and it's never about us. And the narrative is always about I, my narrative, my brand, my bullshit is more important than this. I don't think you can, win, you can build a winning culture with that. I really don't. Right. And just look at it in history. Like the one guy, the one flashy receiver who's won is Michael Irvin, but look who we had around him. He had all these other alphas around him. He had the right coach. He had the right quarterback. I, I really think these, the, 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 those type of receiver, it's just hard. I, I just think it promotes, whether, whether you know it or not, it's a self-conscious promotion of, of me, my individuality over the team. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that kills guys, and I think it's something you see all over the NFL. No, but co coaching it up, man, and, and, and getting these dudes to buy into the run game first and foremost is, is the, the, the way to build that, that selfless uh, mentality in your guys. Like for me, you know, and I, I presented on here before about it, like I, I can't, I personally can't stand, right, when dudes or, or people just talk, oh, you know, it's Monday, like we're starting, nah, like what, what the fuck does that mean? Like, yeah, it's Monday, like, it's just another day. I tell every, every, every day is a Friday night for real. Every time yeah. you touch this field is a Friday night. So the first thing we do, like the Monday starts, like we we bang, like we we're physical. Yep. Well, man up Mondays, and we're out there, and it's it's there's no pass, it's nothing. Like we're just blocking, we're working on our our our, our techniques. We're being physical. We do the uh, we do the one on one uh, tire tug of war yep. that, that y'all do. I mean, it's you already know, like when you come into this week, like you're you're automatically getting into fit the physical aspect of it. You're gonna have to be tough. You're gonna have to fight. Like, that's how we could start the week off. No, no. I, so we had an issue at Bosco two years ago, my first year there, where we were starting games slow, right? We were, we were, we were down 14 nothing into the first quarter, down 17-3 at the half, and then we would come back, right? And we were looking at, like, why are we starting slow? And we looked at it, and we said, well, every practice starts slow. Kids roll in late. Kids get there when they can. We go special teams, and we go specialists, and we do all this shit. And practice doesn't get going until an hour into practice. Right. So then, why, then we're conditioning the kids. When they put on their pads, they don't have to get going until an hour after they put their pads on, right? And so the next year, we started every practice with a compete period. Every single practice was started with a tire tug or with a run game situation, like whatever, just three minutes, four minutes, five minutes, like whatever that was. But you prime them to get your helmet on, sprint to the line, and go fucking compete right now. And that just, that just becomes their habit. Yep. The, the way they think is when my helmet's on, it's time to fucking compete. Not when my helmet's on, I can lazily walk up the hill and get to practice when I feel like it. And then I can kind of half stretch. And then I can jog around while the scrubs are doing kickoff returns. But I'm a five-star, so I don't need to. And all this bullshit, 
fuck that. You show up, you fucking compete right now. And then again, like those little things made, made huge differences, but it was putting the emphasis on competition, putting the emphasis on finish, putting the emphasis on, on, I don't care how sore you are. I don't care who the fuck you are. You put your helmet on, you step on this field and it's time to compete. And, and nobody was above that. No matter if our top player had injuries, no matter what the hell it was. And, and I think that's just huge in building a winning culture. No, no doubt. And, you know, when you start to, when you start to build that up, however you build it up, I think, um, you know, I'm not a big, uh, you know, like I, I'm not a big using conditioning or running as punishment. I think punishment is punishment and separately. So like, you know, we, like I, I started like last spring I was building um, and, you know, it did end up working for us, but, you know, just building mental, uh, that mental toughness with conditioning. So it was kind of like win-win for us. So like, you know, maybe in the middle of like our indie, I just blow the whistle and get on the line and we're like, you know, just getting some runs in or like, like you did right at the end of practice, we may do something like that. Just, you know, to get conditioning in, it's not, once again, I, and I make sure to express that I'm, you're not getting punished at all. We need to condition. We're a group that, right. You're going to be running go yeah. routes and running across the field. Like your, your ass better be in shape. So there were times, right. Where I give them. And the first time I did it, I was like, all right, you guys, we're going to, you know, run our gases down and back. You know, you guys let me know when you're done. You know, I didn't give them, I didn't give them a number. I didn't give them a number. You let me know when you're done. In my mind, Drew, I'm like, all right, if they can get to 10, man, I'll be, I'll be pretty, pretty satisfied, right? Yeah. They're going, get to 10, they keep going. I'm like, all right, this is solid, man. All in all, man, it got to about 24. And it was dope. Like, and they were pushing mm -hmm. each other. And, you know, at some point, right, you know, it happens. People get tired and irritable and they start kind of yapping at each other. And, you know, we explained and, and I pulled them up and I explained the importance of not, you know, when, when times get tough like that is the last time you need to turn on, on your teammate. Right. You know, and then before we wrapped it up, Hey, right back on the line. And it was kind of like, just threw something at them like a curveball, and you have to adapt to that. You have to react to that. Like, right. are you going to just, are you going to like kind of complain and bitch going to the line, knowing that there's one more or like, you can be like, all right, cool, get it done. And that's what it was. It ended up, you know, of course it started off slow. It was new. But when we got to the point where it was like, you know, all right, whatever, you know, whatever we get faced with, let's just deal with it. Let's handle it. And we're going to do it to the best of our ability. That was a game changer, man. It was yeah. a game changer. You know what I'm now, there's no doubt. And back, back to the other question about like the star players. I just, I just like, I, I think that one of the biggest problems with the coaching profession is that there's money attached to it. Right. And that the only reason I could ever think of why you would be afraid of holding your star player accountable is because you're afraid of losing your job and losing your paycheck. Right. Like, like, I just think that like, when, when month, like, like there's a reason why Odell doesn't get disciplined and held accountable the way he does. Right. Because like, it's a risk because he is the highest paid player on the team. And for you to attack that guy, you now have a lifestyle that if you're an NFL coach, you make $800,000. Like the money really clouds because I, I don't, I really don't believe coaching is a profession that doing it the right way you should you should financially be living off of because it, it forces you like think about it when you want to hold the kid accountable in this day and age you have to actually think about your family and think about everyone you're supporting before you open your mouth and and it, and it, it, and it really takes away from you as a coach so i think that like i i get it you know what i mean like I, I coaching was not meant to be anything that was tainted by money it's supposed to be about the players your job as a coach is supposed to be it has nothing to do with you you it's about how can you get the most out of this player whether he's a five star or a bench warmer but yet right the reason we would ever get worried about what is my how is my star player going to react blah 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 is is to me like you're worried about your own job like it's just a crazy thing in coaching i think that it really does taint you know people are in the profession for the wrong reason i'm not saying the guy who asked the question is in it for the wrong reason but i know so many coaches now who aren't in the profession to help kids get better. They're in it to make money. They're in it to say, Hey, if I can draw up the best offense, well, I'll make $400,000 a year as the OC at this school. Or, you know, I, and I think really like it, it, I, that's something I think that's always helped me be successful is I've always been willing to be fired to, 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 st to stand by what I believe. Like I, right. I have no job has ever been bigger than my morals and my values and my beliefs. And, and when I rest my head on the pillow at night, I'd rather rest my head on the pillow unemployed knowing that, I stood up for what I believed in that then, then breaking my values and breaking what I believe as a man to, to save my own job. And, and it's easy for me to say this. I don't have a family I'm supporting with a coaching salary, et cetera. So I get the reality of it, but um, you know, I, I don't know. I just think for, I just think you have to have certain values, certain morals, like certain expectations that just don't break and nobody's allowed to break them. I don't care how good you are. Um, 
but but I think part of that is is you know just you, you have to start it right away. I think there has to be the, the way you get in trouble as a coach to me is when you switch up on kids. Right? Yeah. Like Tom Coughlin always always just say when you when you take over a new team, you have to start as a 10 as a disciplinarian. And 100%. you can always back down to a 5 or a 6 once they kind of get it. But 100%. if you start as a 5 and then try to fucking amp your way back up to an 8 or a 9, the it. kids aren't going to respond that way. Same thing with my, uh, managing a classroom, right? Yeah. And, and, and they say it all the time. It's, it's, it's always easier to loosen up than it is to tighten up. Right. Like, if you start, if you start at, at that top level, everything else after that, you're good. I've seen it, you know, and, I, and you look at, like I said, being, working in a school, seeing, you know, different teachers with different styles of uh, classroom management over the years. You know, I've seen the, the ones that weren't successful or had issues, right, started off on that low level, kind of like, lackadaisical cool with things happening and then when kids started to kind of do their own thing and mess around you know you want to and it's like yo you weren't doing this before like we ain't, we're not we're not doing that yeah. as opposed to someone who's like look here's how it's gonna work there's no questions about it it blah 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 you know whatever and then it's like okay you know and then there's there's those there's those moments where okay you know we'll we'll taper off just a little bit. And I think the kids actually respect that more because they know, all right, you know, obviously coach or, or this teacher wants things done a certain way, right? But, you know, they're, they're still human. They're still human. They're still going to allow us to do things here, whatever, whatever the case may be. But understanding that here's the standard. This is what you got to meet. And that's yep. it. No doubt. You know? Another thing I say to kids a lot is, is – um, talk about a silent movie, right? And I got this from coach dub. Um, but just like, eh, so, so essentially the whole, the whole thing, the whole way he explained it. And I've kind of like built on top of it, but, but you know, in the twenties and thirties, people used to literally like, like movies would travel from city to city, right? Silent movies would travel from, from city to city. And people, when they would get to a certain city, people would line the blocks and, and there'd be, you know, a hundred, 200 people deep around the block to see a movie with no sound. Like why would people, line up and spend time and money to see a movie with no sound because I don't need to hear you speak to know what you're about, right? I don't need to hear words come out of your mouth to mm -hmm. know how you're feeling, to know the way you're acting, to know the way you're talking to yourself. Like I can just watch you, watch you move and watch the way you handle yourself and know who you are as a person. And I think there's, there's nothing more true than that than, than in the game of football. I was, uh, you know, there was, there was a, one of the top agents in the draft this year. He asked me to evaluate one of his kids, a tight end uh, in the draft. And, it was one of the things I wrote in his evaluation was that I like, I know the kid personally. And I know he's a tough kid, but when I watch this film, I don't get that. Like, like I don't, I don't, it doesn't matter if I know you as a tough kid. It doesn't matter if personally me and you, you're a tough kid to me. When I watch you on film, you look soft and your silent movie does not. So you always have to be conscious of like, I am constantly telling a story that people are going to judge my character on when I'm on film. Coaches will judge the way you were raised. They will judge the values you were brought up with. They will judge the type of person you are based on the way you play on the football field. And as they should, honestly, like as football players, that is what we're judged on. The same way that rappers are judged based on the albums they put out. It doesn't matter if you think you're the greatest musician ever, but your albums mm. suck, then you're a shitty musician, period. It doesn't matter what your friends <laughs> think, enough. what you are behind closed doors. This is a performance-based business. And I think that's something people need to understand. And something I tell my guys all the time is like, all right, this is a silent movie. What type of fucking movie is it going to be? The only way to play football is this better be a fucking bloody ass murder movie. Like there better be bodies on the ground. It, this, this is not a fucking rom-com where everybody feels good. And you're the guy who's watching another guy, uh, uh, you know, another guy fuck his wife. Like that's not what this is. This is a fucking murder movie where you are coming out like a savage to attack and put bodies on the ground. If you're playing any other way, if you're trying to create any other movie for yourself, any other narrative about yourself, you're playing the wrong sport. And, and I think just, and, and I think also like this, this just this metaphor, like allowing the kids to realize that you're constantly being judged. You're constantly being critiqued. Yep. There, there is constantly someone assessing your performance and making judgments on you as a human being. Like this is something I talked to Muhammad Sanu about a lot. I go, Mo, like your silent movie 2019 and the Patriots is not the silent. Like it's not something you're going to want to rewatch re when you're 45 and retired. Like you got to really be conscious of, like, what are you putting on film? What kind of narrative? Like, you only – he has five, six, seven years, Mo, right, to play in the league. He's 30, but a young 30. Like, we'll see how long he can last. He cares a lot about legacy. So if you're an older guy who's been in the league seven years and now all, Mo has all the money he needs, right, now he's really concerned about, about legacy. And I think mm -hmm. the thing that's really hammered at home is if you want to be remembered, like, if you want to be – like, th think, of, think about how hard it is, right? Think about how many players come and go in the league every year 
and how many are actually ever talked about after they leave. Very, very few. You have to be so good and so exceptional and so on point all the time to accomplish enough where, where you've actually stood out amongst the greats to where your career deserves to continue to be talked about after it's over is very, very rare. And, and if you're playing for legacy, like that is, that is something that never has time off. If you have the audacity to say that you want to be remembered that way, you're not allowed to take a second off. It, it is that right. Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant mentality that, that we're seeing now in the last dance. We're seeing now mm -hmm. as all this footage of Kobe comes out, like these guys never turned it off because they were obsessed with being the greatest who ever lived. And, 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 and I think that I, I really do think that, you know, like, like I, someone I was watching with kind of made the, the comment, uh, you know, Jordan was just so self-centered. He was so, but it's like, how could you not be? You can't be that great at something and worry about anything outside of, of what your goals are. Yeah. You know, and I, and I think it's just, it's just got to be obsessive. And, and I think you have to be like, I, I personally, like this metaphor hit home with me a lot. It's like, yo, I cannot live with putting a bad movie out there. You know what I mean? I, I can't yeah. live with, with, a, with, with, a performance that allows people to judge me in a way I wouldn't be proud of. And, and if that's the case, then I got to prepare the right way. I got to come with the right energy. I got, it starts with, I got to be talking to myself the right way. Like, yep. right. Like for me to come on this morning and, and give the best talk I could give, the first thing I have to do is be in a good place mentally, be talking to myself the right way, feel good about myself, feel confident in myself. And I have to be prepared. I have to have a plan. I have to know what I'm going to talk about in advance. I can't just be winging it. Right. And, and then you got to go out there and, and put your best foot forward and, and give, you know, just give the best you can. But that, that formula is the same in any walk of life. I think it's the same if you're trying to run a business. It's the same if you're trying to be a great receiver. Do you, do you feel like, do you feel like, uh, let, let's just talk about, you know, from a player standpoint, sometimes not say giving, uh, you know, the max effort in practice or just kind of being distracted. Do you think some of it stems from just not fully uh, being able to focus on the task at hand? Like their mind is in 10 different places. Yeah, I think, I think that's part of it. Like, I think there's, especially as a high school coach, right? Like I've coached at every level now. I've coached D1 football. I've coached D3 football. I've coached in high school. I really didn't like high school for that reason, because you end up coaching bullshit like that. Like, Hey kid, stop fucking worrying about your girlfriend. Hey, stop worrying about these stupid shit that has nothing to do with football. But I didn't, I, I, but like for me, I, it frustrated me because I didn't come there to babysit. I came there to coach football at a high level. You know what I mean? So that's the one thing about coaching football is you have about coaching high school football is you have to be willing to help the players through those growing pains. And, and in the end, no matter how good or bad or talented, whatever, they're 16 year old kids who don't have a fucking clue what's going on. So yeah, I think, I think there's certainly part of, you know, kids don't know how to focus. They don't know how to finish. Right. They've never been forced to finish. They've never been forced to push themselves back past their, their limits. They've never been forced to, they haven't been raised in a way where they have to put the, the team first. Like there's a lot of things you have to overcome. A lot of it has to do with, parenting that you know par like poor parenting you have to overcome or or privilege that a kid has in his life that he doesn't fucking deserve on the football field like a lot of things like or just just straight immaturity like for sure 100%. And, and to me i think that's why what we we're talking about before it's so important to come in with that with a 10 as a disciplinary yep. i whenever i come in somewhere new i scare the fuck out of my players they are so fucking horrified of me and so scared of letting me down and so scared of crossing me because they know i'm fucking out of my mind and crazy they think i might kill them but I think there has to be like that sort, there has to be a level of fear and then, and there has to be respect, right? Like there has to be, there has to be some level of fear of the consequence if you don't do your job and you don't fulfill the expectations, but then there also has to be, but it can't just be fear. There also has to be respect, enough respect. To me, the secret sauce is when, when a player has enough respect for you as a coach that they're afraid of letting you down, right? They're not playing to score touchdowns. They're not playing to impress their family. They show up every day because they care about you enough and respect you enough that they are afraid of letting you down. And, and, and to me, that is the relationship I've been lucky enough to build with every player I've ever had who, who we've been successful with. And, and that's what creates that lifetime bond. That, but that's what – it's that feeling, right? The way I create a feeling where they're afraid to let me down is I build a relationship with them first. Like I spend so, so much time with my players. I spend so much time getting to know them, getting to know their families, getting to know their fears, getting to know their dreams, getting to know all this shit, right? And then when I know all that and it really does feel like I care about them, which I do, it's not even feel, like I truly do love them like a brother. Now when I'm your, their older brother, I can motherfuck them any way I want. I can talk to them any way I want. I can, I can push them as hard as I want. And no matter how uncomfortable it is for them, they know it's out of a place of love and they will continue mm -hmm. to respond. But it takes that hard work of putting in the work to build a really real relationship and, and, 
And, and then I think, so once you're at that point where it's a real relationship, then you can just, you, I think you can beat it all out. All the immaturity, all the, I don't know how to finish all this shit. You can just beat out of it. When they know it's out of love, it might be the hardest thing they've ever gone through. It might be, I might be the craziest person they've ever met. This might be the most uncomfortable experience in their life. But if you did the, if you did it the right way, building that relationship, they're, they're not, they, they will show up and fight every day. And I'll be honest, man, with, with the focus aspect, right? I think, you know, and, and this is something I had, I, you know, I, I know for sure, you know, years ago, I mean, yeah, you got, you know, we're, we're practicing for an hour and a half. You need to stay focused for that hour and a half. And you know, it's, let's be real. Like, at least for me, man, I, it's unrealistic, right? Right. Like I've, I've <laughs> working in school or, and, and coaches have been there and I know you guys can relate. When have you ever seen, right. Uh, you know, teachers in a staff meeting for the whole hour in the staff meeting, they're locked in. No doubt. Hey, dudes, these people are on their phone. They're writing stuff down. They're checking this. They're talking to this person. So we're going to ask a, a teenager to lock in completely, like solely t uh, tunnel vision for an hour and a half, I think is unrealistic. So mm -hmm. what I tell my players is, and I want to, I want them, and I, I, I 100% agree in building relationships is first and foremost. And once, once you get there, yeah, you do have a lot of room to work. Um, I don't even, you know, I, I let them know it's, it's okay to lose focus, but when yeah. you do that refocus, mm -hmm. and it's just that simple. Like I'm not going to sit here and say I've sat in a staff meeting and have been locked in for an hour. I haven't, you know what I mean? But I do, I do uh, tend to like, if I start to kind of, you know, go off on something or whatever, I lose, I, I refocus back up. And I yeah. think when you do that, I think that uh, that gives them the opportunity to understand like, all right, you know, it's not the end of the world that I lost focus, but let me get back. Like you're, you're now conscious that I slipped off. Let me get back. Like it makes it honestly, yeah. to be honest with you, Drew, it makes them really lock in even more, not for the full time, like no doubt from point A to point B, but there are minimal. Now the spurts of them losing focus are minimal. Yeah. Compared to what they were. I think, I think that's well said. And it's something like, I think what I relate to in my, my experience, what we found is, if receivers in general this way, right? Like we were just talking about how mentally challenged, challenging receiver is, right? Because you don't get rewarded for doing your job. Very, if you're, if you're a really good receiver, you have six opportunities a game where the ball's thrown to you. If you're an elite receiver, you got 10 to 12. If you're an average receiver, you got three or four, right? So, so it, it's so hard to, to, to continue to stay positive, continue to stay locked in that you, you can't expect, you have to allow them to be themselves and be loose. Like, so what I found with my guys is, I build the culture of discipline. I build the culture of, of finish and all this. But then once they, I know they're meeting the expectations, I just let them be themselves. That means if you want to laugh and goof off and smile, mm -hmm. like you're allowed to be that person yeah. when the fuck, when it's time to go, it's time to go. And that's the only expectation. But until then, like I, I, I we've, I've always found that we play our best ball, even in like silent hustle training sessions, right? Let's say I got 12 to 15 kids at a training session, the sessions where we're kind of goofing off and kids are talking a little bit in the background and like it doesn't seem as serious they play their best because they're not out there overthinking about technique they're just fucking playing football mm -hmm. then there have been training sessions where i you know i might snap at them and i try to get it more focused and then we get really detailed into like some technique but they end up getting in their head too much right they end up they end up overthinking the technique instead of having fun and enjoying it they're they're getting in their head and trying to perfect every step too much and it takes away the just like the looseness and the confidence yeah. so i do think there's a balance between you have to set an expectation. Here's how the fuck we're going to play. If you're going to represent my name by being one of my players on the field that someone's going to judge me on and my legacy is attached to, there's only one fucking way you're going to play, play for me that way. Only one way. But then once that is established and the kids have bought in and you can trust that that's understood, I, I think a big thing is then allowing them to be themselves. I, I think a huge mistake coaches make is like, like look at Dennis Rodman, for example, right? Had mm -hmm. somebody tried to force Dennis Rodman to be like everyone else, you never would have gotten the best out of him. No, you wouldn't. And, I think, and, I they, think, and they talk about it. And they talk yeah. about it. Yeah. And I think it's the same with every player, that if you can establish that trust and that mutual respect and know that he's on the same page, he's bought into your culture, like I think a huge reason I've had success and a huge reason why my receiver group feels like such a family is that everyone's allowed to enter and be themselves and they're not allowed to be judged for it. No one's like, just be yourself. The only thing you're not allowed to do is not give full effort and not come ready to learn. As long as you come in every day, ready to give your best and ready to learn. I don't care if you want to paint your nails. I don't care if you want to put lipstick on. I don't care what the hell you want to be. You know what I'm saying? Just go as long as you're willing to put your effort in, like everyone from there, like allow them to be a little goofy or allow them to be a little bit more quiet or allow him not to be somebody who's leading by, by words, but leads by example, like whatever they are, like let them be someone they're comfortable and confident in. There's just certain levels that, you know what I mean? Just don't try. I think that's a huge key is don't try to force a kid to be someone he's not. 
If he's not a vocal leader, don't make him a vocal leader. If he's not yeah, a, you know, if he's, but his effort, his attitude, that has to be there. Everything else, I think you, you got to allow the kids to, to be themselves and, and not try to force them to be something they're not because that's never going to work. So now one, one, let's just say one, one of your guys out of the field, you know, run play or whatever and just slacks off, you know, and just kind of, you know, no, like mat, minimal effort, misses the block, whatever. Are you taking them out off right then and there? Or how um, you it, it, de- it depends. Like every situation is different. It depends what co- time of the year it is. If it's preseason, yes, I will definitely take him off right then and there. I will emasculate him in front of the whole team. Everyone will hear me ruining his life and, and questioning his character. And then I'll make him go do up downs and then send him right back in. But I, I believe in if you are going to have the balls, the audacity to disrespect me and not give full effort in front of everybody, then I'm going to treat you with the same amount of disrespect and make you feel like a fool in front of all your teammates. And, and I think I think there's something to be said with that again that feeling of fear right listen everyone should be themselves as a coach too if you're not the type to yell then don't yell like be yourself but there's something to be said it, it, it just you know what you you're a little bit more urgent to fix the mistake when you make a mistake and your mind is immediately filled with fear after because i'm chasing after you with snot coming out of my nose and and motherfucking like there's a little bit more urgency to say hey that really felt terrible let me never let that happen again as opposed to getting your arm around and say hey johnny you know do you understand why that effort isn't helping us? And, I, you know, I think it's – I think you should just try it like that. You think he's going to be urgent to get that fucking problem fixed? Like, no, if you embarrass him in front of his teammates, you don't want to be embarrassed again. So, I think there's something to associating – it's just like training a dog. Getting your players to do what you want to do, like, like it's no different – like, it's no different than, than training it. You beat it the fuck into them. Like, like, you beat it into them. There's no choice but to obey. And then when you do it, you get treated great. But, like, there's, this is not a fucking democracy. This is not a, hey, an equal opportunist fucking society here where everyone needs to feel good. Like, no, this is my fucking way. We're going to do it the way I say with my values and my – like, you're, you're one of my players and on my team in my room. So I think there is, as a coach, you have to have a bit of, like, an ego in the sense that, like, I have a lot of pride in myself, in my players, and the way my players represent me, and I will never allow them to misrepresent me. But the same way, my players will never say they have a coach who doesn't fight their balls off for them. So there's that, there's that mutual respect and that mutual effort. Um, but, but back to your question, like, it just depends. If it's, if it's a kid who needs to be made an example of because he doesn't seem like he's getting it, or we have a group that needs an example to be made because they're not understanding what it means to finish, then, yeah, I think you got to pull them out right away and kind of make an example of the kid. If it's a kid who generally does finish – and, you know, maybe that time he just didn't. Well, then, hey, you can just – it just depends. I think it depends on the kid, depends on where you're at as a group, depends on what you need. Um, but I do believe in holding kids accountable in front of their teammates. I don't think accountability can happen behind closed doors. I think it needs to happen out in the open in front of everybody, so everyone – especially with the best players. Mm-hmm. So everybody can see, all right, this kid can catch it just like anybody else, and we're, we're all kind of equals that way. We're all being held under the same standards. I, I think that's important. I remember uh, Chad Johnson telling a story where when he was on the Patriots and, and they'd come in for camp and the first first team meeting they had, uh, Bill Belichick would show a, a video from one of their playoff losses and he would just rip, rip into Tom Brady for however long. And he was like, it just showed everybody out there, like, if he's going to do that to Tom Brady, arguably the greatest quarterback of all time, right, then what's he going to do to you? Or like, exactly. What's he gonna do to you? So we went out. This was like the turning point of our season at, at Bosco, right? For anyone who knows Jersey football, like that Bosco has been one of the top programs in Jersey back in the day, you know, in, in the mid 2000s, they're probably the best program in the country. They won like three national championships, but Bosco hasn't been Don Bosco prep in New Jersey. Hasn't been the dominant program for a while. This was the, this year we went to the state championship it was the first year Bosco's had real great success in, in, in a long time. And a big turning point of our season was what you just said, a similar moment to, to Tom Brady, right? So we went out to St. John Bosco in California. They're, they're the high school team that ended up winning the national championship. The single bet – I played against Ohio State when I was at Rutgers, and that year they won the national championship. This team, for the level of play, was better than that team. Best team I've ever played against. They were so good and so well-oiled. But we went out there, and again, we have a kid, Jalen Berger, who's a five-star recruit, who was the second highest rated player on the field besides the quarterback. Of all the kids there, of all the five stars they had, he was the second highest rated player on the field. He played the worst game of all of them showed up on national television and embarrassed us. Didn't play hard, didn't pre- did, like was flat. You could tell the whole thing was about himself, right? He was there to promote Jalen Berger and puff his chest out, and, but he didn't play hard. He didn't play the way he should have. And like I told you, right, before this last year, the higher-ups of our program were afraid to hold him accountable because he was every year he was threatening to transfer this, transfer that. Everyone was just afraid that, God forbid, this kid leaves our program. Like, and, and as a coaching staff, 
we kind of made the decision and we watched the film and I was like, guys, I've never been more embarrassed as a coach. It was the most embarrassing performance any player has ever had under me in my entire life. He, it, was, it was so embarrassing the way the kid played. And I kind of looked at him. I was like, yo, I, if I, I, I don't think I can coach here anymore if I don't rip this kid. But it was like, it was like that huge, like talking back to like, if you're star, it was a huge fucking program decision. It was the most embarrassing thing ever that we were allowing this kid to, to have us by the nuts like that because we were afraid to hold him accountable. And I basically stood up and I was like, guys, I can't be here anymore if I don't hold this kid accountable for that. And I got up in front of the whole team and I ruined the kid's life. I fucking, every little moment of softness he's shown over the last three years, I hauled him out for Like it was just this moment where for the first time, there was like this sense of relief in the room where everyone was looking around, like finally this kid was held at the same standard as us. Like finally, you could tell every kid in the room was like, finally, like finally, this kid doesn't feel like he's bigger than us. And we won nine straight games after that. Like it was just a huge turning point, I think, for guys to see, like, okay, you're really, you're really now backing up what you say. It's one thing to say, hey, finish this, finish that, but when everyone's not being held to that standard, it's never gonna really, like, kids are never really gonna buy into it. It was, it was that moment where, where you know, we we humanize the kid. You know what I mean? It's like you, you can't allow the Odell Beckham's, the Chad Johnsons, the five star recruits to become bigger than the team. Even though I, I it's easy as a coach to think I can't win without this kid. I think you would always rather play culture beats talent a hundred times out of a hundred, in my opinion. And the minute you allow, ta- the minute you allow your talent, the minute you allow your talent to, to diminish your culture is you failed as a coach. And, and, and I think you would rather like, you know, and I think that it was a huge lesson for me to watch just the way kids responded to accountability and, and the way he has, he, he came to me at the end of the season. He goes, coach, no one's ever talked to me like that. No one's ever held me accountable to that, but thank you. Like the kid, thank you. Like he appreciated yeah. it. You know what I mean? I think, I think every human being, every kid wants to be held accountable. Even if they resist it, if they resist it, if they fight back, if they talk shit, it doesn't matter. Every single kid wants to be held accountable and wants to know that somebody cares enough about them to push them past their limits. And I think especially like when you deal with inner city kids and kids who don't come from much, a lot of times they are the first ones to fight back because they're so used to that, that, accountable figure just disappearing in their life, right? So they're constantly, I've seen so many in your city kids that they are the troublemakers because they're constantly testing how much you care because so many real male role models in their life aren't there for them anymore. And they push, they push. And eventually that guy did go away. So it is like that, that, that constant deal where like they're so used to the important male figures in their life leaving, they're always going to test you to see how loyal you are. And I think it's something you, know, again, understanding the nature of a receiver understand the nature of who your kids are and where your kids come from and what their backgrounds are and realizing like, fuck, like this kid has never been raised with a, with an authoritative male figure in his life that he has to respond to. So he doesn't necessarily know how to respond in the situation. He doesn't have somebody holding him accountable. He has a mother who's working two or three jobs just to get by and he's on his own. So like, I think just understanding your players and how to get, get through to them and, and all that shit's important, man, for real. Uh, that's a, that's a good point. And I'm sure, you know, as coaches, I think every, Every coach has, has dealt with something similar to that. And uh, obviously, you know, there's, there's still a handful of coaches in here. I'd uh, be curious to see what some of you guys, I mean, if you guys want to drop it in the chat, but if you guys experience something like, I mean, it happens everywhere, right? You know, you have that you have that dude that uh, needs to be held accountable and maybe wasn't, and, you know, you finally do it, and, and it, it is a game changer. It absolutely is, and it's it's a must. And it's a great point. Um, you never know what somebody is is going through or not, or not going through or not being taught. So. Uh, for us to just assume like, okay, this kid does know, this kid does know how to do it. He's just choosing not to. That's not always the case. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's the same thing. Like a few years ago, um, we had a, we had a team and, you know, just lacked the, you know, senior leadership. And, you know, I know it was harped on a lot. Like, you know, who's going to step up and be a leader, do this and do that. And I'm shoot, shoot, I'm sure I even, I, I already know, like I was one of them that was saying that. And then, you know, it took me some time to reflect and I'm like, coach, like, you know, we're sitting here, we're sitting here telling these or asking these guys or really telling these guys to be leaders, but like, they don't know how to be. So how, you know, how is it fair for us to yeah. ask them uh, to step up and be leaders when they have no clue what it, what it takes to be a leader, what, what needs to be done. Exactly. That's unfair. That's the same way we're talking about coaching finish. You have to coach leadership also. Like, like no doubt. You know, well, like you- and it's great to see like more programs, right? They do these leadership councils where they have these, um, leadership groups or meetings and things like that. And it's building that up. And I, and I love, I love when coaches do that. And I love uh, seeing that stuff because you need to coach it in them for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. They, they have no clue, no clue. There's no doubt. You know what I'm saying? So, 
Uh, yeah. What What else you got, bro? That's pretty much like we didn't get a ton into the run game, but it's pretty much all I got as far as the. Steve, I like um, hey, if any if any coaches in here has, have any questions uh, in regards to you know some of the the building the mental toughness or, or run game stuff blocking, I mean we kind of we started talking about it a little bit. Um, probably not as much as we had thought about. Kind of you know we we started talking about the, the building toughness aspect, which is huge. Um, but you know we could talk about run game stuff for for a few more minutes here if anybody has any questions, but. I, I'm telling you, man, I, I, if anything, if, if anything, I, I hang my hat on, like, on, on just as far as the physical techniques that I just hang my hat on the run blocking stuff. I love it. Yeah. And I think you get a kid to do that. I, Drew, you know the deal. Like, I don't have to sit here and get a kid excited about learning a new release or, or no. catching a, or catching a jump ball. But I do got to get him to buy in to being like, you know what? Like, I got to be the best blocker on this field. I got to be the most physical dude on this field. And you got to get them to buy into that. But once well, and, and, I, and I think getting them to buy into it is, is a direct correlation of what you value as a coach. Yep. Like, like to me, Effort to me. It, 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 right. It, it's what you value. They will value what you value, but also like you have to, you can't just value run like blocking in the run game because like, think about this, right? You've all watched opponent film. You judge other receiver coaches when you watch other receivers play, right? The first way you have respect for another coach is when you see their guys, his guys blocking their ass off. The first way, the first way, if I'm watching a team and I see a, and I see a receiver who's not finishing, I immediately say, that coach fucking sucks. So that's the first thing I think, that coach is a pussy. That's the first thing I think. That when I see receivers running around knocking heads, I immediately have respect for that coach. And again, I care about my legacy and my reputation and, and being represented the right way. So I, I think for me, like I genuinely value run blocking over everything else because I genuinely think that is the most – direct way to display their commitment to me and it's that if I'm a good coach the way I can display that most directly is getting my kids to play hard in the run game but some coaches I think really think that being a good coach is creating an all-american receiver whoever can have the most catches and all and then and whether they pretend to value the run game or not it becomes clear in their in their intentions that that they value other things more than that and and you know they don't it, I go crazy over the run game like oh, crazy over that shit. No, me too. And, and you know, what? more importantly, probably it shows the commitment to the team, right? You're yes. willing to do whatever it takes. I'm telling you, like, you know, this, this past season, right. You know, our, you know, our best receiver uh, set County records for receptions, touchdowns, one of the top kids in the state, best blocker because he had, he already knew like that. That's exactly. what's expected. That is what's expected. So like, don't sit there. I, I don't want to, you know, you can't sit there and say like, you got to choose one or the other. It's not that case at all. You get your, you can get your best guys to do it. Um, it's just about building and, and once again, showing what's important to you. And that's, a, and that's the thing, right? It always goes back to, if you, if you prove to these guys that you care about them, they'll care about you and, and care about what you care about. It's, it's, it's that simple. So to me, right, that run game stuff it shows a few things, right? You know, your commitment, you give effort and you're tough. And those three things will, I feel like will carry a long way. So first and foremost, for me, it's like, you already know what it feels like. This is, this is a must. You know? Yeah. It's that it's that important to me that I will I'll, I will sit our best guys. We won't throw a ball no. in practice. Whatever no. whatever I got to do to get the point across. All right, that's what's going to be done because you guys are coming into a situation where you have to be physical, you have to be committed, right? You have to get max effort. You just it's a non-negotiable. You know what I mean? Non-negotiable. It's a mental it's a mental battle too, man. Like every time you're not whooping a DB's ass, he thinks he's better than you. Like every time you're not punishing the guy, like think about DBs, right? They are better than you when, when nothing happens. Like when, when you don't get thrown the ball or nothing comes your way, that means they won the rep. Like that's a DB's job is just, it, uh, you know, a, a great corner cannot have the ball thrown to him one time the whole game and he played the game of his life. Whereas it's the opposite at, at receiver. Mm. But, but the way they think, right? The minute, so the minute you do nothing, the minute you don't challenge them, you don't put them on their ass, they think they, they continue to build that mental edge and continue to gain more confidence and continue to think less of you. You know how hard it is to cover a guy in the pass game when you're also scared shitless of him whooping your ass in the run game? Say it all the like, time. Like, man. you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. I say like it all the time. Fear, fear, fear is the demise of execution. I think Steve Sar Sarkeesian said that. Fear is the demise of execution. If I have a DB who truly fucking fears me, he has no shot of covering me. No right. shot. Right. It makes your life so much easier. It makes your life so much easier in, in, in everything. When, when you set the tone in the run game first, like it, it, it changes everything. You definitely wind up with more space and all that. I'm telling you, like, we even get to the point, I'm like, you know, because obviously you, you play, you know, you'll play DBs with all, you know, that play off coverage or whatever. They're back. Like, 
my guys, and you can and you can see it on film, like my guys are chasing dudes off the screen yeah. because it's like I don't even care if you're 25 yards down the field, like you're just gonna know we're in your space always. Like you're wherever you go on this field, if I'm if my job is to block you, like I may not end up getting to you because you're running away, but you know like I'm chasing right. you always. Always. That yeah. is that is that's just what we do, man. And I so, love it. I love watching that stuff. I tell them like I would much rather I would much rather see you guys put a dude on his ass, all right, than 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 score a touchdown. I mean, don't get me wrong, everything is good. I'm gonna praise you regardless, but trust me, man, when I can watch a dude be physical and just manhandle another a def, you know, a defender into the ground or really set that 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 physical edge, that physical tone and gain that mental edge. To me, you know, I, that's that's it. That's it for me, man. That's it, man. You know what I'm saying so. Yeah. If anybody, if any coaches have any questions, man, uh, just drop it in there. Um, yeah, drop it. In. And if you guys want to, like, if you guys have any other questions, you want to DM me at sideline hustle on on uh, Twitter and Instagram. Um, but I'll answer your questions as long as I want, as long as you guys want. Yeah. I gotta run though, Jay. But I'll be back for you guys. I'll be back next Wednesday morning. I'm not sure what we're gonna talk about, but if you guys have any. Uh, if you guys have any que- like like things you want to hear from me, I know we can get into the run game a ton. We can do that again. Yeah. Um. Sure. If 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 just so guys know, if guys like are interested or need you know want any sort of assistance with drills or anything, we've got a VIP program for coaches. Go to Patreon.com/slash/SidelineHustle. Um. And just been it's been really dope. We got we have like 130 people signed up. About 20 of them are coaches right now. Um. And it's just been a cool community of just like sharing drills with each other, evaluating each other's film. Uh, you know, talking about this type of stuff, motivation, whatever. We got our own kind of little sub coaches culture. So um, just, just trying to help guys develop their players as much as they can and, and giving drills and kind of sharing my system of coaching receivers. So if you're interested, again, patreon.com slash sideline hustle. It's been, been a cool little deal with that VIP program. Absolutely, man. Well, always, always a pleasure, man. Uh, and like coach said, man, we'll be, we'll be back at it with this on, on next Wednesday. And yeah, if anybody has any uh, suggestions or, you know, you have any questions on, on topics you want to discover, uh, excuse me, uh, cover, and we'll kind of, you know, we'll, we'll we'll roll with that. But it's been fun, man. I I think we do need to uh, definitely touch back on the run game and just get into some yeah. film and drills and stuff like that. I know I have some stuff I can show, and of course you have you have uh, stuff that you can show as well. So oh, no. you know what I mean. But coaches, yeah. appreciate you guys tuning in, man. Um, we'll be back at it at eleven o'clock, and uh, we have a few sessions today, and we'll rock and roll. Also, if there's any, uh, you know, I know there's a few coaches in here. Um, obviously we started. The, uh, the the player evaluation station. It's every Tuesday and Thursday uh, for you know for an opportunity to showcase uh, your student athletes, which is super important. Uh, just make sure you register. I, I posted the link before this Thursday. We're kind of focused on D two and AI level players. Um, you can just uh, uh, register. Must use a school email, and uh, you know you can get the opportunity to to be selected. There's four coaches per region. Um, if any college coaches are in here, obviously you guys are more than willing to, to check it out and just DM me or send me and shoot me a text and I'll, I'll send you guys the link to it. Um, but it was great. We started last night with, with high academic kids. Um, you know, a bunch of coaches came in, showed off their guys. Uh, you know, coaches were in there. There was probably, at, at all in all, there was probably between 10 and 12 college coaches that, that were watching. Um, a handful of the guys that, that showcased their, their student athletes, um, their, their players were, were, were contacted uh, soon after because it was, I mean, there were some dudes on there. And, uh, you know, guys, and it's crazy, right? Guys with, without offers and things like that. I mean, high academic, you're talking about 30 ACTs. I mean, it was, just, it was just cool to see all the different talent across the country and the fact that we can offer up a platform uh, where, where coaches could showcase their guys and college coaches and get the opportunity to check guys out, especially during this time, right? You know, I know there's a couple of college coaches in here. You know the deal, like, you guys are, you know, it's communication and, and film evaluation. So, we're just giving, we're just offering up a platform where you can do that all in, you know, a one-stop shop. I mean, all in all, right. You're, you're seeing, I don't know. I mean, there's 20 coaches that go, they may show two kids each, may show three. It, it all depends, but um, it was a lot of fun. And, and if you guys are interested, just uh, reach out to me um, and I'll get you more information about that, but appreciate it.